The story of our church begins with one man who heard biblical truth and had a desire to proclaim it to others. And we continue to exist as a church that proclaims that unique message. The story of our church actually dates back to about 1845 with an evangelist named J.H. Shipman. He had a distinct view of what the Bible says and uh, it fell on the ears of uh, uh, Peter Bauk and of course we know that Peter Bauk was instrumental in uh, beginning the work in the Font Hill area. The history of the um, Church of God in Font Hill was um, spoke of quite often and we did learn the history of the, the Bokes. I have a long connection to Glad Tidings. It actually dates back to Peter Boak, who was my great-great-grandfather. But I remember his picture distinctively from hanging up. What I do remember, we had his picture in the basement of the old church. Elaine and I were maybe eight years old, and she and I were both looking at it, and I said, oh, I'm related to that man and he started our church. And she said, oh, I'm related to that man and he started our church. I, we're both thinking the other one's wrong until ultimately, obviously, we checked with our, our parents and found out we were both right. But I do remember that. And so I guess we were always told to be proud of our heritage that Peter was a founding, uh, one of the founding fathers of the church. But when I was young, I didn't really think much about him because all the pictures of were him with this long beard, an old guy, right? So I knew he was my great-great-grandfather, but when you're young, you don't think about that much how important it is, right? History's a little bit vague on uh, just exactly what Shipman did do, but we understand from what we've read that um, he did preach at a location called the Hoover School, which is located in Thorold Township, uh, from what we understand, possibly near Belk Schoolhouse. Peter Belk recalls the message that was proclaimed to him by Elder Shipman, the message that he received, and that is that the restored earth would be the future home of God's people. The emphasis on the earth itself being restored and being our future home is something that is not taught in mainstream churches. But at 21 years of age, he accepted the message that Shipman was preaching. And from that time on, Peter Belk became a diligent Bible student, and on February 2nd, 1846, he was baptized. When Peter Belk started the church, he was 21 years old. It amazes me that he had such boldness and bravery to, to, to venture out like that. It's obvious that Peter Belk must have been pretty excited about what he had heard and what he had learned and obviously was eager to share this with his family, his friends, those in his community. And our congregation was born. From what we understand, the group that uh, was led by Bauk uh, continued to meet at the Hoover School uh, in Thorold. My understanding is that it was they met there and then the Bauks owned property, I believe, and then ultimately donated it for another schoolhouse to be built. I think that's correct. In the early years, the group was known as the Church of God and sometimes referred to as the, the Second Advent Church because of their strong belief in the Second Coming of Jesus. The believers continued to worship as a group and over time the group grew larger, eventually uh, finding the need to uh, build a house of worship and uh, in 1858 uh, one was constructed. In 1891, the congregation moved into Font Hill. They began meeting in the upper area of Dalton Hall, 
which is located on Highway 20 in Fondale. In 1904, the congregation formally organized as the Church of God in Font Hill. Plans were made to construct a church building directly across the street on Highway 20. In 1904, the congregation met and formally decided that they should hire their first full-time minister. The man they selected was F.L. Austin of Indiana. Longtime member Viola Goit remembers the fact that she and her husband Ed were actually mentored by Pastor F.L. Austin. They remember Pastor Austin as being a man of incredible strong faith and with a strong desire for the scriptures, though as he uh, advanced in age, they do have, recall a funny quirk of his that he would sometimes forget what he had to say while, while he was preaching and he would actually knock on his head to see if he could remember. After construction, the new church was dedicated on February 14, 1909. F.L. Austin served as the pastor of the congregation from 1908 to 1922. In those days, we had a congregation in Niagara Falls, New York as well. Austin would travel back and forth to minister to both congregations. It was during these years, in 1916, that Peter Bout passed away, but he did serve as an elder all the way until his death. Pastor Austin was involved in the process of forming the General Conference. He and his family left Font Hill in the early 20s. In Oregon, Illinois, F.L. Austin served as the first Executive Secretary of the General Conference. He was also the founding professor of the Bible training class, which eventually became our Bible College. He edited and published the Restitution Herald, which is still published to this day. Back here in Font Hill, G.E. Marsh replaced F.L. Austin as pastor. His great uncle was Joseph Marsh. Joseph Marsh was a pioneer of the Church of God movement in the 1800s. G.E. Marsh served as pastor of the Fondale Church of God from 1921 to 1928. Viola Goit remembers that Pastor Marsh and his wife were very active in the General Conference that he wrote frequent articles for the Restitution Herald, which demonstrated that he had a great understanding of Scripture. From 1929 to 1930, Grover Gordon of Nebraska served as pastor. Beginning in 1931, Ly Randall began 17 years of service here at the Church of God in Font Hill. He served until 1948. Longtime member Betty Anger who herself is a descendant of Peter Bauck, was baptized in 1944 by Pastor Clyde Randall. During his time here in Font Hill, beginning in 1933, he began holding services in Welland. As a result of this work in Welland, several families accepted the Lord and joined the Church of God. These included the MacArthur family and the Dillamarter family. Viola also remembers Pastor Randall. Viola remembers that it was there in the church in Niagara Falls, New York, that Pastor Randall was the one to officiate at their wedding and was the one who baptized them. Viola said that she will always be grateful for the influence that Pastor Randall had on her and her husband had. It was also during this time, in 1942, upon
parsonage was purchased, it was located on Church Street in Font Hill. I mean, I remember my mom when she was growing up that uh, they went to church twice on Sunday. Sundays were um, very calm, quiet days at home. She was one of six children. She was a tomboy. She was allowed to read her Bible and or just play quietly with her dolls and that was pretty difficult for her to do. In 1948, Grover Gordon returned to serve as pastor until 1953, at which point he was succeeded by Melville Lyon of Illinois. He served from 1953 until his sudden death in 1956. Interestingly, Lyon wrote hymns that are still found in our hymn book, including Shepherd of Israel and Heavenly Father, Hear Us. In 1956, Mylon Hall began his pastorate here at Fond Hill and he served until 1961, at which point Edward Goyt of Niagara Falls, New York, served until 1962. I think you'll hear a lot of us talk about the May meetings that were held in the church for many, many years. That was a highlight of the church year, and there were people coming from, even in my early days, people that came from Toronto, people that came from the States, that all came to little old Font Hill to hear a message that they didn't necessarily hear elsewhere. When I was very young, my parents sent us off with my grandma and grandpa. And I remember looking forward to every Sunday morning going off with my grandparents. And we would take a lot of the kids in the village of Font Hill with us. But I also remember living at the top of the hill and walking down to the bottom of the hill for Bereans and how I look forward to that every Sunday night. Barbara MacArthur remembers the fact that she and Reuben were teachers of the Berean youth group in the late 50s and early 60s. I have fond memories of growing up in the old church, being baptized in our original church building. It's also delightful to note that one of my Sunday school teachers was Viola Goyt, and she still faithfully attends each Sunday and she's one of our, she's our oldest current member. Our story continues as we enter into the 1960s and our church saw the need for a new building. We can assume that there must have been growth at this period of time. You know, I was quite young then, but I certainly remember the pews being filled. I remember most every Sunday we had that whole sanctuary full. We used every nook and cranny of the church building. And I have memories of the old church and how we were overflowing. I think everybody saw the need to find a a place to spread out more. Under the leadership of Edward Goyt, the congregation was encouraged to set funds aside to purchase land for a new church and a new parsonage. On December 15, 1961, it was announced that an offer had been made on a parcel of land located on Hillcrest Road in Font Hill. Hillcrest Road was later to be known as Pancake Lane. On May 27, 1962, the property on Pancake Lane was dedicated to the glory of God. Also in 1962, Emory Macy of Ohio began service as pastor here in Font Hill. He served until 1971. A contest was held to name the new church, and Eleanor Payne submitted the name of Glad Tidings, which is the name that was chosen. So I remember coming up with good news. For some reason, I think Ed had glad tidings some in there. And whether they decided, hey, here's a young one, <laughs> um, let's just go with that and say, she's the one who named the church. So I'm not exactly sure about that. 
this Bible was presented to Eleanor L. Payne, and that it's got the names of uh, the elders and people who are on the committee, which is neat. In 1964, the Mary Martha's group was established. Uh, the Mary Martha's were a very active ladies group that uh, raised a lot of money. I do remember when we were teens growing up that um, Doris Lane and, her, and uh, her crew, they would do the meals at Davis Hall and we were the server girls. My mom was a founding and eventually executive member of the Mary Martha's and this was a group of very dedicated ladies who worked diligently. Their main goal was to try to eliminate the mortgage on our beautiful new building here. They had um, a roast beef dinner at least once a year. I remember a lot of this because my mother was a Mary Martha and the daughters worked with them. <laughs> Many of us, um, Bonnie, Elaine, and, and Lorraine and I remember serving at a few of those. Doris and my mother were good friends and Doris was the kitchen convener for many years and we all learned a lot from Doris to um, how to serve. They truly were the unsung heroes of our church. I'm pleased to say we have two of those ladies still attending faithfully with us, Barbara MacArthur and Jean Coverdale were part of this esteemed group. In November of 1967, Frank Lane was hired as the contractor of the new construction. In March of 1968, the congregation gathered for a groundbreaking ceremony. On the property, they marked an area in the shape of a cross with chalk. We have a picture of my mom and my dad and me separately putting a shovel in the ground. Um, they had put the shape of a cross out front here and, and we did that, so I certainly remember that. Brother Bowesville, the oldest living member, had the honor of digging the first shovel full of dirt. He used an antique shovel that belonged to the late member Charles Elliott. I just remember us all taking our turns to go and break the ground. The congregation with one voice declared, we will build a new church to the glory of God. Sunday, April the 26th, marked the cornerstone service for the new church. Some of those who were in attendance for this cornerstone service were actually in attendance for the original cornerstone service for the church on Highway 20. So the first Sunday in September of 1968, a service was held here at the new church. The congregation walked all the way from the Highway 20 church to the new church on Van Gag Lane. Sticks in my memory yeah. that we met at the old church and we all walked down the street through Font Hill to go to the new church for our first Sunday there. It must have looked pretty funny. Eh? <laughs> they sang hymns and they praised God. Viola recalls that she was one of those who paraded and walked from the Highway 20 church here to the church on Pancake Lane. This marked the end of one era and the beginning of a new one. On Sunday, November the 17th, 1968, the congregation held a service of dedication here at Glad Tidings. It was such an important day. I mean, it was so much work went into leading up to that day. Former pastor Clyde Randall was our guest speaker. It was nice to have Clyde, Clyde Randall back. There was a lot of people here and a lot of guests. Reuben MacArthur was the building committee chairman. I think he just had to make sure that everything was planned out and executed. Um, and that's Reuben, right? Like, it's amazing. He made a special point of recognizing Frank Lane's contribution to the new building. Quite amazing that we had our own member that could actually build the church. 
Frank and Doris Lane were very good friends of my parents. I remember Frank's laugh, we could tell him a story, and he had such a hearty laugh. Interestingly, Frank Lane's grandfather was the contractor for the original church on Highway 20. They were of the generation also. Uh, you pay off the mortgage, you pay off your debts, then you worry about uh, um, seeing what, what else what you else can you do can. with the funds. In May 1977, a Parsonage Committee was formed with Reuben MacArthur as the chairman. The Parsonage on Church Street was sold and helped fund the new one. A service of dedication for the new Parsonage took place on May of 1978. So with a new church building and a new parsonage in place, Glad Tidings was positioned to minister to the people of Font Hill and the Niagara region for many more years to come. This is the story of Glad Tidings Church of God here at One Pancake Lane. Pastor Emery Macy had been serving as pastor since 1962. He oversaw the transition from Highway 20 to Pancake Lane. He, he was very influential to get my parents actively involved in the church. He, he seemed to have a knack of finding ways to in, influence people. When I was young, um, our minister was Pastor Emery Macy, and I remember him with fond memories, along with his wife Mildred. And she was our Sunday school teacher for many years. One strong memory I have of Emery was every Sunday he would take my hand and he would shake my hand and stare in my eyes and say, when are you gonna get baptized? Pastor Macy was the minister that baptized me and it was a year that many of us um, got baptized. The day I was baptized in the old church is something that very much sticks in, in my memory. I was 12 years old and our pastor Emery Macy always um, focused on encouraging the young people to think about baptism at Easter time. So in 1963 was the year that I thought about it and I actually was one of the, I was sort of an add-on to the group that was being baptized on that Sunday night. I decided at the last minute I wanted to join that group. I was 12 years old. I remember that day very well and I know that I cried when I came up out of the waters of baptism. <clears throat> And I cried now thinking about it. That was such an important part of my life. And I never turned back in my decision. And a lot of you know that there was a group of us that did get baptized at the same time. And I really believe that was divine intervention, how that all transpired. Uh, the year that I was baptized, there were a number of young people that went forward and accepted the Lord as their Savior and some of them are still coming to this church today. So I believe it was Palm Sunday, 1964, when Pastor Macy made the call, and I believe there were 11 or 12 of us who came forward that day. We were then baptized the following Sunday during the Easter sunrise services, so it was a very special day for many of us. In 1971, he was succeeded by John F. Herb, otherwise known as Jack, who served as pastor until 1984. Jack was a tall man, six foot seven. And he was someone that had worked in, in business for a while and then he decided to go into ministry. He actually pastored one or two churches before he came here, but and he came as a single man at that time. He had lost his wife. But he, he, Jack just had a way of uh, gathering people together, gathering good people together and helping everybody learn their gifts and how to use them and work together as a team. That was one thing I really always think about Jack. He made you feel important. And, and then several years after he was here, we met this lady named Louise that eventually became his next wife. <laughs> and she came to then join him in the ministry. Jack is especially remembered for being active in the community and supporting many works. He was, he was a very personable person. Spend his focus on people. Obviously, Pastor Herb is uh, 
I have fond memories of him because he married, uh, married us in 1973s. And his wife, Louise, was just a delightful lady, retired school teacher, and just a lovely, dedicated, wonderful Christian couple. We had the idea of getting a new Sunday school bus then, and we got this rainbow bus. In 1984, Jack was succeeded by Stephen Bolhouse. Steve's wife, Joyce, is a descendant of Peter Bouck. And they were the first ones that were more in sort of the same age group as me. There was the excitement initially that they were coming, they were going to be our age, they had kids. Oh, I, I loved them. I love Steve and, and Joyce and, and their kids. Uh, Steve was a very good speaker, he still is a good speaker today. Um, they were all musically inclined, all of their family. Steve was extremely, is extreme, extremely talented musically and his, his whole family. That's one of the biggest things I think we think about with the Bowhouse family is the musical uh, contributions. Their kids brought other kids here, definitely, and they were involved in like youth things abroad. We had good times, a lot of good times together then with the youth, the young people, the uh, young adults as we might call them at that time, uh, doing a lot of things together and Steve brought a different vision for the church. He brought, uh, to me, he brought new life to the church, enthusiasm, um, his family was a lot of fun. And uh, Steve was very strong with his uh, biblical teachings and we definitely learned a lot from his sermons. And I, w I was the youth leader for a little while and I had his children and um, but they taught me more than I taught them. <laughs> also he was a mentor to others who were um, you know in the ministry as I recall now I'm trying to think it was Michael Schisler and John Welsh, as I recall, were the two that we had. And that was just a wonderful time where we had somebody else helping with our church and with our, our people. Michael was and is, I mean, he's he's very outgoing guy. He's very, very personal and he did a lot of good stuff. Yeah, he was quite an asset to the community here. Glad tidings grew throughout the 80s and into the 90s. Oh, there were a lot of people when Steve was here. Yeah. There, there, he did bring a lot of people in. One of the highlights for Glad Tidings was the summer that we hosted the general conference here in Fog Hill. Uh, much of it was held at Brock University and it was a very exciting time for the congregation. One of the highlights of st the time that Steve was with us was when we, he had the dream that we host the general conference. That was a historic conference because it was when the delegates made the decision to move the headquarters from Oregon, Illinois to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. A chance for us to uh, play host to many of our brothers and sisters from throughout the states. We had a lot of people from out of town, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. He also was one of the committee that created the new hymnal for the Church of God, which was a big accomplishment too. Uh, in the history of the church, there have been good times and there's been bad times, or more trying times, I guess, times of testing. Um, I can remember a couple of times in particular when groups of people, for one reason or another, uh, did leave the church. And because we all felt we were family, it was like losing a family member and made it very difficult. And But we still had to carry on with the Lord's work and uh, so we did move forward. And hopefully those times are behind us. and healing has taken place. That would be our prayer anyway about those people and we still hold them in high esteem and care about them. I found during that time when some people were wanting to be more charismatic that it was troublesome. Now that I'm that much older I understand more where they were coming from. It hurt when we lost those people. It really hurt because a church is a family, and we were a family. I felt like we were bonded together, and that breaking away was very difficult. I think in, in, every, in every circumstance, when a pastor first comes, everybody's so excited, and we're all 
you know, everything is so happy, happy. And then in every pastor's life, something happens when it's time for them to move on. In some cases, it's because another church calls them. In some cases, it's because they've changed their, the way they want to do things. And so it, it's always a tough time. And especially if it happens where there's some disagreements and then it hurts both sides. And, and it's, hard, it's hard to get past that to move on but with the bullhouses it was it was nice that they did want to stay here in Canada and then they found other another place that they could then um, start up the kind of church that they wanted to have. In the late 90s we found ourselves without a pastor for a period of time and while we were waiting to fill that position Frank Toth rose to the occasion and spent some time acting as our pastor and we we're definitely blessed for that time. He was where we needed him at that time. We were, however, eventually blessed with a new pastor, Mike Montgomery, and his wife, Myra. And Myra is Alva Huffer's daughter, so I already knew them from many years ago. Oh, Michael was great. Um, he was a good speaker, and uh, he had a really nice family, his girls. My mother was the Sunday school teacher of the Little Jewels at that time, and she loved his little girls. He, again, another man that uh, decided to go into the ministry many years later after he had already worked in a uh, teaching career in his case and they my dad had met up with them in uh, Ohio at a Northeast conference took a couple of attempts and they made the decision to do it um, they were both from warmer climates and it wasn't too long after they were here that they got a call to uh, pastor a church in South Carolina a very large church so they decided that they'd like to move them to a little bit warmer place. They did a lot of wonderful things for us here. But uh, it was a great time even in that short time that they were here. In 2002, Michael Brown began serving as our pastor. But my, my, my dad was talking to Diane and Michael soon after we heard that Mike and Myra were going to be leaving. And somehow Michael and Diane said, we'd probably be interested maybe in coming back. They say time flies when you're having fun. Well, when we look back at the almost 12 years that we served at Glad Tidings, we can honestly say it went fast. We enjoyed those years as one of our best times since I began pastoring over the last 45 years. His wife Diane grew up in her church and is actually a descendant of Peter Belk. And she's also a sister to our current elder, Elaine. For me, it was home since this is where I grew up. I remember hearing church members talk about young people leaving home and moving to the States after they graduated from high school, but not coming back. They go to college, get married, and end up staying in the States. After my husband and I had children who grew up, had families of their own, and settled all around the U.S., it was my joy when the church invited us to come with the prospect of my husband pastoring the church in 2002. Because Diane had been my neighbor and a uh, uh, fellow church member. Another sweetheart, you, you can't say anything derogatory about Diane. So that was just wonderful knowing that they were going to be coming. Moving back to my home church was such a blessing and it does show that you can come back home. Uh, Michael is, is an excellent preacher and an excellent singer and he he put a lot of work into the services. Michael was very good if, at visitation, at hospitals and stuff. He always came when my dad had surgeries mm -hmm. or anything like that. He was very good for that. Um, when my dad was dying, he came to the house because my dad was at home. The youth in our church at that time, they sure kept us busy. Or maybe I should say, looking at uh, the things that we did, kept you busy and Diane thought of the idea of having the Faith Girls uh, for the adolescent girls to learn how to uh, have more self-esteem. Uh, I know Diane made a big difference in a lot of girls' lives. Working together with some of the youth for weeks before these events and putting some of the older ones to work as the helpers gave them good training for the years ahead. Even though it took a lot of patience at the time, it all worked out when each event took place, thanks to everyone who took part. And I'm grateful as well for our special services. 
Of course, then there was the revival services we did featuring Robin Todd and the concert he presented at our church. But you know, one of the special things we did was the diaper project. That was a great success. That's right. You know, we collected over 2,000 diapers for Paul and Laura Fairbrush and their twin babies. We're happy that as a result of that effort, you are now enjoying the blessings of their gifts and talents through their involvement. And don't forget our Sunday school picnics out under the tree. <laughs> yeah. All ages had food, fun, and fellowship, including the games. Everyone had a good time for that, yeah. yeah. Were some more somber moments though, like the many funerals that I performed when we began at Glad Tidings. I never imagined I would direct the funerals of so many of our older, longtime members. Leaders like Elders Howard Shue and Ed Goyt and others like George Coverdale and Ross Anger. Bill and Phyllis Myers, and Alf and Rena Payne, and, and the oldest member I had the privilege of performing her for a funeral was 104-year-old Caroline Dillamarter. You know, if there was one important reason why the Lord sent us to Glad Tidings, it was being there to help make the transition from many of the older generation, who's no longer with us, to make way for the next generation. The seeds for our, our next pastor were planted even before we knew it, probably, in 2013 when um, we had these special meetings with Steve Taylor and we had Robin Todd here and Marty invited some of the people he had started getting connected with, Dave and Joanne Gray, I think they attended quite a bit of that weekend and had a, they had a, um, got connected with Daniel who had the Messianic Niagara. Um, group and uh, so we didn't even know at that time that Daniel was being already kind of groomed to be our next pastor. It was my curiosity and really in my in my 20s it was my curiosity to perhaps think outside the box to look at the Bible in a different way and of course that led me uh, online to discover that there are many many different ways of understanding the Bible but it was this particular understanding of God and of the afterlife of the kingdom of God that really struck me as something that made a lot of sense. I got in contact with uh, a man named Marty Dorst and we had mutual friends Dave and Joanne Gray that we were able to connect with one another and, and know really of what's what was going on here at Glad Tidings and I had heard that uh, Glad Tidings was looking for a new pastor. Though I had been attending Bible College in Toronto and, and I had certainly been diligently studying the scriptures for many years, I, I really had no idea that I would become a pastor one day. You know, Jerry Cook, who was the elder at, at, at the time and still is of course, um, he was at the front and he was talking about how they are searching for a pastor. So I thought to myself, I'll have to, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to speak to this guy, Jerry. And uh, so I went up to Marty after the service and I said, I, I, can you please introduce me to, to Jerry? Marty introduced me and they immediately had Sarah and me uh, meet us right here in this room, in the prayer room. Uh, we had a meeting with the pastoral committee. I recall, if I'm not mistaken, I recall they included Marty in the room because he introduced us. But I think it was Terry Byberg. Lisa Fairbrush and Paul Fairbrush in addition to Jerry and Elaine and that was the first meeting that I had to to present myself as a possible candidate to become the next pastor of Glad Tidings. We felt God's spirit right away telling us something is happening. I will never forget as long as I live the Sunday um, that Daniel came with Marty and that was the the week that he uh, offered to um, put his name in the hat so to speak to uh, to try out as pastor here at the church and and I knew from that very moment that God was in that there was a, a tingling or 
a strange sensation that went all the way through my body. <clears throat> and that's when we started talking with Daniel and Sarah and, and exploring this opportunity that all of a sudden sprang up in our own community to have someone. And we had decided that we wanted a much younger pastor this time. My first memory of Daniel was the Sunday when he came to visit. I was excited to see a new face and then I didn't see it for a couple of weeks and then I was hearing things, you know, that he was interested. So there was some bit of doubt, I have to admit, but I knew a lot was going on there and then when we had the meeting at our house and understood what Daniel and Sarah believed. I was excited because he was young, or they were young. I, I can just recall saying to Sarah that I, I really hope they give me a chance and that this is what God wants for me. I had a dream about Daniel and Sarah that uh, that they were going to be our pastor. He was going to be our pastor, and my dream came true. Well, it, and it was so amazing that, that all these things that happened, like Marty coming to our church and having all of these beliefs, and then being connected with others that then got connected with you, people coming to these same beliefs that we have from a totally different vantage point, to me that that's what, over the years, that's what always has made me think there's something here. And then when I saw the people that Daniel was bringing, I was very excited about that too. It just almost boggled our minds that it, you could actually be the ones that exactly, when we looked at the skills that you were bringing, were exactly what we knew we needed. So we knew that it, it was the right thing. And so they needed somebody like me and I needed them and that's really what's defined the relationship. Then I heard that uh, they had hired Pastor Daniel and I was hearing all these great things about him. My mother got sick and I hadn't met Pastor Daniel at all. But she was very sick and I reached out to Daniel and asked him to call my mother at the hospital in Hamilton and pray for her and with her. And he did. And she came through that surgery. Then I had a personal problem and I reached out to Daniel and Elaine and Jerry and they all were very comforting to me. And then that's one reason I wanted to come back to Welland was to be back with my church family and I felt a connection. I can honestly say that I have the strongest connection with God right now in my life, even though I'm older, and with the church and the people in it and with the pastor and his family. And that's from my heart. And I'm very blessed to have them. Well, before we moved back to the area, I had emailed both Jerry and Eleanor and Elaine. I said that we were certainly looking forward to coming back to Glad Tidings. They both spoke very highly of Daniel and Sarah. Our first Sunday here, Ken and I came back to many hugs and, and um, lovely smiles. And I remember meeting Daniel and I also remember he introduced me to Sarah and I remember thinking, my goodness, she's a beautiful lady. It was refreshing to see a young pastor, uh, obviously very much enthusiastic about his faith and uh, welcoming and uh, energetic. And uh, I think that just, uh, just uh, was the icing on the cake. Uh, right from the start, Daniel, um, was able to preach to help us out when, after Michael had left. And, uh, it was obvious that Daniel was the right person for the job, although we had to put him through the hoops and uh, just test him and make sure that he truly was the, the right person. And I believe it was September 2014 when I was officially hired to be the pastor of Glad Tidings. Not long after that, we were able to move into the parsonage uh, Sarah and I attended General Conference in 2016 and we were officially recognized as uh, ministers uh, of, the, of the Church of God General Conference and uh, at, here at Glad Tidings with Seth Ross as our executive director and uh, with so many great pastors out there and so many young people uh, that I was able to meet as I continue to take courses through Atlanta Bible College. I've been meeting uh, several young people who are now entering into the pastorate. And I just am so confident that, that God is with us going into the coming years. It's been so encouraging over these last 
four or five years to work through together as you're as Dana was learning we're learning we're all learning together we're teaching each other different things and that that's encouraging when people ask me what I'm doing now in retirement I say I'm helping to train a pastor <laughs> um, in different ways I mean not what you learn at Bible College but just how to do church administration in a way it's been such an honor to serve in this leadership position as, as pastor with the, our two elders, with Jerry Cook and Elaine Shute. I've learned so much from them and I've benefited so much from their years of experience and from their willingness to work with me. I'm so grateful to be working with them and I can't wait to work for many more years with them and, and just to see what the Lord is going to do through us and in us in our church. Here we are four and a half years later and uh, the church is doing wonderfully. Uh, we've got lots of ideas, lots of new things are happening, but we're still holding to uh, our faith. We're, we haven't changed that at all. And, and I'm excited about the future with Daniel and Sarah serving us here. Glad Tidings Church of God has been here at One Pancake Lane for 50 years, and we've been a church for over 150 years but we feel like we are just getting started. We are a church that wants to move forward into the future. We want to pass on our faith to the next generation, and we want to see God do mighty things in and among us and in our community. If you have a desire to go deeper, if you want to know God more, if you want to know the scripture like you've never known it before, I encourage you, join us here at Glad Tidings. Remember, this is just the beginning, and we look forward to the future. God bless you, and Maranatha. Our Lord Jesus is coming soon, and to that we say, Amen.